Welcome to another Wise Words Academic Seminar hosted by the Contemplative Study Center at the University of Melbourne. I'm Nicholas Van Dam, Director of the Center. I'd like to begin by respectfully acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, who are the traditional owners of the land on which many of us are residing. Uh, we pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging, and to any Indigenous peoples that may be joining us um, today. Uh, today, we are, we are joined by Dr. Ruth Gamble, a lecturer in environmental humanities in the Department of Archaeology and History at La Trobe University. Uh, in today's presentation, Ruth will question whether Buddhism, or any religion really, um, can or should be ecological. What social, cultural, political, or scientific frameworks can we use to judge whether any belief system, particularly a non-Western religion, is or is not ecological? If you have any questions, please post them in the Q&A at any stage, and Ruth will address as many of them as possible towards the end of the session. Um, thank you for joining us, and welcome, Ruth. Thanks very much, um, Nicholas. Um, I'm glad to be here today. I'm just going to start um, sharing my screen um, and, and get on with it. All right. So um, um, I've got to be honest. Oh, no, before I start anything else, I also wanted to acknowledge uh, country. Um, I'm coming to you today from the lands of the Wiradjuri people of the Kulin Nation, and I want to pay my respects uh, to their uh, elders past, present and future. Um, I also want to acknowledge, um, particularly as someone who focuses on history, that this land was never ceded, uh, so I consider it to continue to be Indigenous land. And really doesn't matter what I think, I guess, but yeah, I wanted to uh, acknowledge that I'm on unceded Indigenous land and um, uh, extend my respect to any First Nations people that may be in the audience today. Um, okay, so yeah, that's kind of framing where we are. I also wanted to frame a little bit about um, who I am and why I'm talking about this today, which is something that I don't usually do in this way. Um, I, I'm, I'm much more used to talking about environmental change in the Himalaya and Asia more generally than I am to talking about the interrelationship between uh, Buddhism and uh, ecology. Um, but in, because I'm talking about Buddhism and because I'm talking about it in this specific framework, I think it's important that I basically come out as a Buddhist in this context and acknowledge that that's, that I've been part of um, the Buddhist community since I was um, 15 and that I'm speaking from a perspective of a, a practitioner of Buddhism, a bad one, um, but still trying, um, and uh, uh, not just as an academic who's interested in ecological change. Um, I also wanted to say that there's particularities, I think, about my... Um, relationship to Buddhism and the way that I uh, encountered it that also inform this discussion. And one of them is the fact that I got interested in it at a very young age, uh, in my mid-teens, and that I did it in because I was became interested not necessarily just out of a kind of a curiosity about religions or whatever, but as a kind of imperative to basically stay around and stay uh, alive because I uh, lost friends to drugs and there was a lot of um, issues in their community. Um, and, and the other thing that is important to acknowledge in this context then is that I kind of have stuck with it. Um, I've been a really badly disappointed by some aspects of the, um, I, I, was, I became involved in Tibetan Buddhism and I've been disappointed by some aspects of the community. Um, and, but I've also been encouraged and uh, um, I, I don't know, uh, taught uh, by some amazing teachers from all different traditions. And even though I've been disappointed with some of the outcomes and some of the things that have happened within the tradition, um, I always keep coming back to these ideas of emptiness and compassion. And also that um, you can't really, it's really hard to get a sense of getting beyond yourself if you're only working with your own intellect. So I think that the traditions and lineages uh, are also uh, as important as these key ideas of, em of emptiness and compassion. So it's not just something that I see as an intellectual and uh, intellectual part of my being, but also a social um, element of my being as well. So um, yeah, so that's one aspect. Another aspect that I think informs my uh, uh, reading of the relationship between Buddhism and ecology is that I grew up in Queensland on the lands of the Chubul, Jagar and Waka Waka people. 
I spent a lot of time outside. Um, I really wanted to be a marine biologist until it, I realized that it involved a lot more maths than snorkeling. Um, but, but I was in a space where there was a lot of environmental change around me, a lot of development. The beaches were being dis, dis, destroyed. Um, and we saw this kind of fight over the environment firsthand. Along with that fight over the environment, I also saw firsthand a lot of violence against Indigenous people, as well as their country, um, in my environment, and um, kind of um, that framed a lot of how I understand uh, history and colonialism and like what our position is in Australia as uh, settlers. Um, so, and also but the last aspect that I was bringing to this analysis is that before I did my PhD in, uh, in uh, Tibetan history, I did, I used to work as an interpreter for monks. So basically after becoming a Buddhist at an early age, I went over and studied um, Tibetan language and philosophy in India, and then worked as an interpreter for a while. And that kind of um, meant that I was in a space where I had to live within Tibetan worldviews, within the language. Um, you can't kind of, uh, the, the language sets the framework for the worldview and then work to try and make the two different worlds understand each other. And I did that for quite a few years. And I think that that, um, that kind of experience of trying to translate the two different worlds to each other um, gives me a particular in, insight, but also a particular um, experience of what actually Buddhism and uh, the translation of Buddhist ideas is. Right, now I'm gonna get on with it. So um, I first wanted to say that I, I actually think that the question that I posed for this talk is Buddhism an ecological religion is in many ways kind of a dumb question. And I, I acknowledge that it's a dumb question um, to ask. So I think it's a dumb question because it can be answered in so many different ways, right? But I also think as well as being a kind of an intellectually dumb question, it's also an important question to ask. Um, so, I mean, I mean, the reason, okay, let's start. The reason that it's a, I think it's a dumb question is because you can't define the terms, right? You can't define what is Buddhism and you can't really define what ecology is. So to ask if something is an ecological or not, is a intellectually sloppy question. But I think sometimes by being intellectually sloppy, we can get at things that we may not necessarily get at if we were being completely logical and kind of academic all the time. So I'm taking a deliberately sloppy kind of every man approach or every person approach um, to, the, to the relationship between these two uh, ideas to see what we can come up with. And I also think it's an, as well as being a dumb question, it's an important question to ask Firstly, because loads of people have suggested that Buddhism is an ecological religion. And this goes back to um, the, the ideas first proposed by our historian called Lynn White in the 1950s in an article that is invariably described as seminal. Um, and, and he talked about how the religions of the West, Christianity particularly, was a cause for ecological destruction and stated that Buddhism may be a religion that is better adapted to ecological sustainability. Well, he didn't use the word sustainability because it was the 60s, but uh, ecological continuance uh, than Christianity. But he also said, um, as we'll get onto, that he didn't think that Western people as like a category could really become Buddhist. Uh, so he wasn't sure that it would work. The second reason that I think that we should be engaging with this, um, this kind of dumb question is uh, it, it kind of gets us to think about the two ideas, Buddhism and what Buddhism is and what Buddhism is not and what ecology is and what it is not. So it gives you a framework for thinking about these. So Buddhism is a sprawling, complicated concept and idea and practice that is found in different expressions throughout its 2,500 year old history. Finding the edges and the centers of Buddhism is, is really trick tricky. Ecology's history is a lot shorter, but it's still complex and has blurry edges as well. So I wanted to look at the blurry edges between these two things. And I wanted to question how we can say something is a Buddhist, is a Buddhist intervention in the way the world works and when Buddhism interacts with other elements and particularly I want to know, I want us to question how Buddhism 
can or even does interact with what as like someone who's researched environmental history I see as the centuries long plantation colonial capitalist megalith. There's a lot to unpack there, I'll get through it, that has transformed our biosphere in unprecedented ways starting about 500 years ago, but really rank, cranking up after World War II. And the third, fourth reason, I reckon that it's a good idea to ask this dumb question, is it because it gets at something else that um, we don't really think about a lot. So a lot of time people talk about this, this idea that uh, stories or ideas or the way that we see the world will actually materially change it. And they make this assumption based on, I don't, uh, based on the uh, fact that people say they have ideas and that's why they're doing things, right? So for example, if you believe in capitalism, then you will want to increase your um, profits and then that can lead to extraction. So, but I want to kind of question this and problematize it as um, humanities people have a want of doing and to say, does that really work? Can we actually say that intellectual ideas, like intellectual history, affects environmental history? Do our ideas actually shape the world we're in? Or do ideas blend in with other more material histories and uh, other elements? Um, or, or do they not affect it at all? That's the sort of things I wanted to question in the chat we're having. So first of all, um, just for, the, for those who are really uh, don't know that much about uh, Buddhism, I wanted to put Buddhism in its place or places. And this is part of the reason we have problems defining Buddhism. It is in many places. Uh, so Buddhism was founded by the historical Buddha who lived in India around 2,500 years ago. From India, it traveled on different routes. It went through from India down to Sri Lanka and Southeast Asia. It went uh, up the Silk Road through Central Asia into China and then across to Korea and Japan. And it traveled through uh, from India again in another transmission into Tibet and from Tibet up into Mongolia and Siberia. Uh, the, so you get these three major kind of transmissions and uh, lineage uh, maps or lineage journeys in, in Buddhism. I also wanted to think about for a second, which doesn't usually come at when people describe the transmission of Buddhism, the uh, biogeographical regions that it travelled in, because they are immense. They go for everything from like, we're talking about tropical rainforests when Buddhism used to be the main religion in Indonesia. Um, it's still a major religion in parts of Southeast Asia where it's a very tropical environment, all the way through to the, the Silk Road and the deserts of Central Asia, the steppes of Mongolia, the, the mountains of Tibet and Nepal, uh, the plains of China, the, the uh, um, valleys of Japan. It's such a diverse space into which it traveled. So um, as it traveled into these spaces, the other thing about Buddhism is that it was very much a shapeshifter. The Buddhist tradition talks about some things. It talks about uh, a lot about how a Sangha, the ordained monks and nuns should live. It talks, uh, the Buddha talked a lot about re the renunciation they were supposed to engage in, how they were supposed to leave the world and engage in meditation and so on. But there's a lot left unsaid as well. There isn't really strict descriptions of how you should, for example, run a government or how you should interact with your, your environment and so on. So what happened then as it traveled is it usually um, blended with uh, the ideas uh, like the indigenous ideas in these places and you ended up with some kind of hybrid between the two that the people of the place didn't necessarily see as being hybrid they understood it all to be their belief system uh, which included elements about from that came from the Buddha elements that came from local traditions so for example the places that I know the most about is the Himalaya and when it moved into this environment, there was so many spirits and the places uh, kind of, in, in people understand the place to be completely uh, swamped by spirits. I don't know if that's the right word, but there's just spirits all over the place, spirits and gods and deities. There was a very um, a lively, uh, lively spiritual geography in those regions. And the way that Buddhism interacted with it was sometimes to curtail the practices that people had, particularly if they involved um, sacrifices, animal sacrifices and so on. But most of the time, the idea was that the local deities, the local practices would be subsumed into a Buddhist framework 
and the two things would work together. That meant that a lot of traditional knowledge, traditional connections to the land, traditional understandings of place were preserved within Buddhism. It didn't have to kind of shape shift as much as it did, did in other traditions. Um, yeah, particularly, uh, I would say, in Christianity. So you get a very heterogeneous Buddhism. And, and in fact, to talk about Buddhism is kind of a weird thing to talk about. What you actually had from this spread in all of these uh, different regions was Buddhisms with a plural S. Um, so we're, we're dealing with a lot of, um, there'll be a lot of S's in this, in this talk. When Buddhas, Buddhism went into these places, they, there's a kind of big arguments now in the historical literature about how much the Buddhists transform these places um, and how much of it was Buddhists transforming places or Buddhism transforming the places, if that makes sense. So Buddhists, because they were connected to international trade networks and Buddhism actually traveled with traders uh, along, these, uh, along the Silk Road, for example, they, the Buddhists themselves were responsible for transforming environments. They transformed it directly by doing things like building monasteries and stupas and setting up pilgrimage sites. Um, they also um, transformed it in by, by building things like libraries for their texts and so on. There was a, like a textual basis that would, wasn't necessarily there beforehand. And they created a lot of Buddhist material artifacts and um, even from early stages, a lot of Buddhist waste. There was like material that they were using that, that was left in the environment. As many of them were traders, they were involved in the development of urban centers and trade networks. And there's also this really fascinating connection between Buddhists and the development of rice growing. So rice growing is a, rice growing is a really interesting element that underpins the development of Buddhism, because if you have rice, it means that you have more calories per person and more excess and therefore that with that excess or surplus, you can support communities that aren't necessarily involved in the growing. So there was this connection between rice and Buddhism. But uh, what I want to think about is um, how do we, how much of this do we understand as being Buddhist transformation of the environment? How much of it is Buddhist rice? And uh, how much of it is um, a Buddhist, uh, uh, is just Buddhist being within bigger political and social and economic systems. And they, I mean, the other way, there's another way to do this as well, because the positivist people saying nice things about Buddhism would say that they protected groves of trees and that they had a tradition of uh, conservation as well. Um, but then that wasn't necessarily, that was usually because the trees were inhabited by spirits and so on. So whether we can talk about it in a context of ecological conservation is up for debate. Uh, so, yeah. So that's uh, one of the uh, one side of it. I also um, I've got I've lost a slide, so I'm going to just explain it to you. So the other thing that um, we, when we talk about Buddhist conservation is that um, Buddhism in Buddhism as we understand it is something that was pretty much invented by um, white guys in the 1900s and the 2000s. I kept having this discussion when I used to teach uh, religion uh, a while ago that I was like, anytime you see an ism describing something, it's because someone in an academy described it. So you had this idea then of the, the people who invented the idea of Buddhism as a world religion, Buddhism as something that was cohesively understood between Korea and Thailand and Central Asia were people who are categorizing religions and developing an academic understanding of, um, uh, of Buddhism during the 18th and 19th and 20th centuries. So they came up with this idea of um, describing something as Buddhism and then applying that idea to the different places that they saw this phenomenon manifested. So the people in those places didn't, wouldn't necessarily have had an idea that they were connected to other places. And um, uh, yeah, and I know that like John Powers, who works at the Your Center has done a lot of work looking at this idea of where did the idea of Buddhism come from and, and did, was there an idea of Buddhism uh, before this uh, academic uh, construction of the idea in, in the 19th and 20th centuries. But see, this is the other thing, as well as Buddhism being invented during these times, we also had ecology 
also being invented during this time. And I think uh, often when we, because we're so embedded in ecological crisis, we forget that that was a recent idea as well. And it's a much more, it, the idea of ecology as a world system, as a, um, a, as a as something that we rely on, and came about around the same time as this idea of Buddhism as a world religion. The first person to use ecology as a term was a German scientist, Ernst Henkel, in 1866. But it wasn't kind of, it didn't really take off until we had Charles Darwin a few decades later talk about ecology and the relationship to, uh, to evolution. That was on the, uh, that was for the word ecology. And the word environment, and, and to talk about this construction of the word environment, I'm relying on an excellent book that I recommend everybody read called The Environment and History of Ideas by Paul Wall. Paul Ward, Libby Robin, and Sverka Sorlin, and uh, Sven, sorry, Sorkin. And this, uh, in this book, they explain how it, the environment didn't come to mean what we think it means as a space in which you have um, earth systems and, and systematic connections between, uh, between elements that we rely on for, for life. It didn't mean it, it didn't mean that until post-World War II even, when we started having to deal with a period that, uh, that environmental historians call the Great Acceleration. So this period post-World War II, the Great Acceleration, is, is the period in human history when humans began to profoundly change the earth systems and this led to the challenges that we have now. So there, there was a a massive increase in population. There was a massive increase in industrialization and in exploitation of uh, resources and so on. The other thing that we need to keep in mind when we're talking about this idea of these, developing these big ideas of the environment, ecology, and say Buddhism, is that we, when we talk about them, we tend to do it in English in the West and have this idea that everybody maybe is thinking the same thing that we're thinking. And th this really isn't the case. And one of the biggest examples of the one that's probably most important to us uh, that I wanted to bring out, just this is just a side note, but it gives you a sense of what we're dealing with here when we look about these two words together, is uh, how this term ecology, um, and it's often used to mean environment as well, is used within the, within the Chinese language and Chinese context. So this is really important at the moment because ecological civilization, Shen Tai Wenming, is the principal program that the Chinese state has, uh, has used in order to deal with everything from the climate crisis uh, to the transformation of the environment. But the lineage that this word has in Chinese is very different lineage to the word, to the etymology and the construction of the word in English, um, which Libby and her friends talked about in that book. So ecology, um, shen tai, came into Chinese through the Japanese word sai tai gaku, and it was a term employed to talk about la landscape aesthetics and development. The ideal for this is the garden as opposed to a healthy ecological system and the taming of those uh, systems. So we're still actually we kind of the reason I'm bringing this up is because I think we're kidding ourselves when we think about ecology being a uh, singular concept just as much as we're kidding ourselves if we think about Buddhism as being a singular concept. So despite the fact that we're dealing with a whole bunch of Buddhisms that were turned into one Buddhism by people in academies um, and in colonial institutions in academies, um, that's an interesting part to add to it, and ecology and environment were um, invented basically by people who were just down the hall from the Buddhism inventors, uh, this idea of how these two things get together has had a really, how Buddhism and ecology interact has been a really a big topic for a lot of people, uh, a lot of scholars uh, and a lot of people who are trying to live in the world basically, like, or, or, or like me, trying to be good environmentalists and Buddhists at the same time. And the idea of the link between those two actually came back, it goes back to this uh, seminal article um, that I mentioned earlier by Lynn White. And uh, it, it, this is the historical roots of an ecological crisis is the name of the uh, article. And within this, he made, he said a few sentences about Zen Buddhism. And uh, this was in the sixties. And I actually really love this um, quote because it's very of its time. So Lynn White speaking in the sixties said, the beatniks, so this is the people who followed on from beat poets and Jack Kerouac and the like, 
the beatniks, who are the basic revolutionaries of our time, he said, show a sound instinct in their affinity for Zen Buddhism, which conceives of the man-nature relationship as very nearly the mirror image of the Christian view. Zen, however, is as deeply conditioned by Asian history as Christianity is by the experience of the West, and I am dubious of its viability among us. So his idea was probably Zen Buddhism or Buddhism in general um, may be better for the environment and Christianity, but he didn't think any Westerners could ever become Buddhists. So he was wrong, <laughs> basically. A lot of uh, West, uh, Buddhism has taken off in many different ways in Buddhism, uh, it, sorry, in the West since then. Um, but it's, it's still not, and I think this is really important, we'll get back to it, it still really isn't the place where most Buddhists uh, live, is not in Western cultures. It, most Buddhists don't live in Western cultures, but Western Buddhists, including myself, who gets to talk to people over the internet and so on, um, have a, tend to have louder voices, uh, tend to be the people that um, promote their, uh, their um, form of Buddhism the most. So in some ways we tend to hear more about it and then think more about how it exists, right? So within this kind of very much Western sphere of, of, of Buddhism, they, there was people really pushing for the idea of ecological Buddhism from the 70s onwards. Um, some of them were actually beat poets and particularly Gary Snyder. Um, but it, within this context, there was also Joanna Macy, there was groups within Zen traditions in a lot was based in California, Amer particularly America, promoting these ideas. Um, and they were particularly focused on three aspects of Buddhism which were also the three aspects of Buddhism that became focus or foci, I should say, uh, for Western Buddhism in general. It was a different form of the, of the religion, uh, another Buddhisms, like another S on the end um, to the ones that you found uh, in Asia. And these, these three elements that Echo Buddhists focused on, the first one was this idea of philosophy. They said that this Buddhist idea, uh, so, um, Pratitya Samutpada, my Sanskrit is really crap. So um, I know in Tibetan it's Denting Jawa Chungwa, and I'm much more confident with that. Um, uh, so lots of times people talk about this idea as being dependent origination. The Echo Buddhists talked about it as interdependence a lot, a lot more. And they um, it, originally, I mean, there's so many different versions of dependent origination uh, within Buddhism that's hard to talk about it as a generalization. But the earlier tradition, in the earlier traditions, it had this idea that, it, that, that things didn't arise by themselves individually. They arose in dependence on other causes and conditions. So it's this idea of there being a network of causes and conditions. But in some East Asian traditions, it was extended and combined with the idea of um, Buddha nature to talk about all of the things in nature being part of an interconnected web. And so when the earth system sciences started talking about webs and the, uh, the, the, the uh, echo Buddhists were like, well, we have an idea like that and combined the two without really thinking of the, the different trajectories um, that these, uh, these uh, ideas of connections and system were, had come from. And then the next thing that they talked about a lot was this psychology. Psychology is always really important in Western Buddhism. And they had this idea that the sentience of being, focusing on the sentience of all beings, all beings having a mind, importantly, not most trees, unless there's tree spirits, but um, non-plants, like all other beings having a mind was set Buddhism up to be a good ecological religion. And um, Joanna Macy has um, done a lot of work in this area and helped a lot of people, I should say. Um, even if I don't quite get where she's coming from a lot of the time, she came up with this idea of the ecological self, that if you blurred the edges between the idea of a self and the environment, that um, you yourself would extend out into the environment and you wouldn't be, uh, you, you would be uh, in more in tune with the environment. And the third way they talked about it was something that's uh, kind of, I think, harder for uh, Western Buddhists to get their heads around, but they seem to be taking up is this idea of ethics. They had a critique of greed as a cause for suffering, universal compassion and loving kindness as a, as a motivation for engaging in environmental actions. And also there was this big focus on vegetarianism because of the idea that all beings or all animals at least had sentience. So that these all developed very Lynn White's um, idea that we wouldn't be able to, that Westerners wouldn't be able to become Buddhists. So after these, 
people started coming up with this idea of being echo Buddhist in the um, in the 70s and 80s. There was a lot of organ academics, um, mainly who uh, started saying, well, that's just a bunch of baloney. Uh, Buddhism was never ecological. You're making it up. You're, you're adapting things. You're making things up. It's, if you go back and look at the texts and the, there's that kind of like academic idea of um, Buddhism inhabiting the texts uh, and not being as, as fluid as it, it possibly could be. And so they've developed into this big ongoing conversation about whether you could say Buddhism was an ecological religion or not. Right. And it got to such a debate that one of these analysts, uh, Donald Swearer, he decided to break down all the people arguing about eco ecology and Buddhism into different groups. And he said that you have some people who he calls eco apologists who state that from the outset, Buddhism was always a holistic, ecological, um, sensitive to environment religion. Uh, yeah, he says, and he puts people in this category, such as Gary Snyder um, and also Joanna Macy, and also the Dalai Lama, which I find very strange having listened to the Dalai Lama's teachings quite a bit. And then the next group he called Echo Critics. And so these were, um, he, these were basically mostly academics and people uh, saying that this is anachronistic, uh, Buddhism never had an engagement with the environmental issues before about the 70s and 80s. They have made it up and put that back into, um, into Buddhism. That was the next group. And another group he calls the echo constructivists. Um, he says they are people who go, yeah, we didn't have it beforehand. These are people promoting the idea of echo Buddhism. Say so we didn't have it beforehand, but we need to adapt Buddhism to deal with the situation as it is. And he says there's also echo ethicists who emphasise that idea of the ethical contribution, focusing on less consumption and less um, production of uh, things that are going to destroy the environment. And he also talks about eco-contextualists, which is Buddhist thought, people who understand Buddhist thought should be embedded in local, local communities. So um, there's, hang on. So there's a there's a lot in that, and I kept I've been thinking about this from a, a lot of different perspectives in the last few days. This is the one ones that get me, and I think um, what Donald Swear has done is interesting in categorizing everyone. But what we haven't brought to this idea is a uh, is it kind of a post-colonial and a um a, or a settler colonial or a, a, any kind of anti. Uh, a, anti-imperial thought patterns of, of any kind um, to, to engaging with these ideas because it seems to me that you have like for example um, there are people who are much more kind of sensitive to the way that uh, local groups or people who ha have to work within the large uh, structures of the kind of capitalist uh, colonialist world that we've created they have different ways of adapting to their situation. So um, a, a, a good, a really excellent scholar, Gelsang Dorje Butia, he's flagged, he talked about this in relation to the way that uh, Sikkimese people, so Sikkim's a state in Northern India and the Himalaya, and he talked about it in the way that they relate to trees. So he says, for example, that uh, using an anthropologist called Paige West, that the, the people in that region didn't necessarily make up ideas about how Buddhism had always been ecological or that Buddhism um, or, or adapt it uh, to a, a new context. They tried to understand what was happening around them um, based on their worldview, which was grounded in this combination of indigenous uh, knowledges and uh, traditional ecological knowledge and Buddhism. And so by doing that, they engaged in what Paige West has called an act of transition to make sense of changes in their world. So in some ways, I think we need to be very generous and try and stand back a bit and look at how these processes are working, as opposed to deciding whether someone's doing the right thing or the wrong thing, or whether they've misinterpreted Buddhism or haven't interpreted Buddhism. So, um, and I guess that kind of makes me more like an echo contextualist, but in some ways, I think, um, that dividing people into all of these categories and saying one person's this and one person's that is kind of an example of what the problem is in the first place. Humans are complex. They, societies are even more complex. People can be eco-apologists one minute, critics the next, constructivists the next, and trying to categorise everyone and decide who's right 
and who's wrong in this instance is an example of the faulty kind of uh, archaeology of knowledge that we've developed uh, in the Western academic tradition that we need to move past. So <laughs> um, uh, this, this has kind of definitely been a vibrant debate and for me it's been a really interesting way of looking at things uh, but I wanted to think about how uh, all of this history and these engagements between environment and humanities, uh, sorry, environment and ecology on the one hand and Buddhism on the other, um, is uh, what, what we can take from that. Because I think that the debate up until now has been missing a few things. It's been missing a lot of environmental humanities insights into what, how we construct. The environmental humanities is like um, takes humanity's ideas, particularly those around power and the production of power uh, and also the uh, con constructions of states and, and, and societies and so on, and uses them to look at environments. I don't think we've used a lot of these in this discussion of Buddhism and ecology. I really don't think that we've been thinking about how we construct our ideas of Buddhism and ecology from post-colonial or anti-colonial insights. And then, and even if we reduce the consumerist capitalist critique to being about how Western Buddhists can um, buy less, I think we're doing a disservice to it there as well. I think we can be um, quite a lot more radical in our critique of this interaction between ecology and Buddhism and see where that, where they where that takes us. Because in some ways, uh, the interactions between environment and Buddhism can give us an insight into examining not just uh, the um, academic practice of Buddhism, but also the Western practice of Buddhism. How do we be a, a good uh, Western Buddhist without? A, uh, how do we, well? How do we be a anti-imperialist Western Buddhist? I think that's a big challenge. It's something that I'm still uh, grappling with, and, and and I think that this discussion between ecology and, and Buddhism is is something that we can use to delve into that. And one of the ways that I think it helps us delve into it, and particularly if you use some of the environmental humanities devices, is uh, it, it makes us think about, if we, if we start looking at play space, that's that contextualized, I guess, I guess it's from, um, uh, from that idea of like place, the one that would be, be uh, categorized as, cat as contextualized Buddhist analysis. Um, it's, I would like to more think about it as play space because you can't really have Buddhism by itself. You can't really have Buddhism uh, outside of societies, cultures and environments. It doesn't exist outside of those things. It's, it exists within them and it interrelates with them. There's no hard edges to Buddhism. It's always interacting. And I think that it, it, engaging in those ideas tells us something about who we can be as Buddhists, how we can be, how we can take responsibility for our roles in the things that are happening to ecologies and also to uh, specific, to develop empathy for people who are using, uh, who, who are experiencing ecological degradation in much more dramatic ways than we are. So I think that idea of focusing on place-based contextualized elements of Buddhism means that we will learn, for example, the idea of a shadow land, which is uh, something that Val Plumwood um, came up with, uh, who was an Australian environmental historian. And Val Plumwood had this idea that there's these spaces in the world where all the bad stuff happens in order for us to have a good life in another place. And we pretend that, that, we don't, that they don't affect us, but we take all of the things from them uh, when, we're, when we're trying to, when we're living our, our complicated, um, well, we're living our resource heavy uh, life that we usually lead in the West. So looking at place-based analysis of how Buddhism works in places, in all different places around the world, I think gives us an insight into how that Shadowland, Shadowlands phenomenon works and encourages us to take responsibility for uh, some of those things that are happening to other people, to develop empathy in very real um, emotive ways as opposed to uh, abstract ideas of I should be a good Buddhist and think everybody's uh, and, and wish everyone to be free of suffering. And the other thing that are hopefully this idea of place-based Buddhism and looking at things in context, trying to use the environmental humanities to deconstruct the way that we can, that we study Buddhism and that we are pra even practicing uh, it as people in the West is to think about how we can develop solidarity 
and solidarity with uh, not just other Buddhists, which should be a given. And we think about it, the majority of Buddhists are people living in places that are in keenly impacted uh, by, envir by environmental uh, changes and, and environmental issues, particularly like those living on the lowlands in Southeast Asia and in the mountains in, in Central Asia. So not just to have empathy, but also solidarity to figure out ways to enact that solidarity. Uh, yeah, and, and to also think it, it comes down to little things as well. Like I, there's some amazing work being done about the idea of Buddhism and waste. Um, Trini Brox and other people working out of Copenhagen have been looking at this about how um, Buddhist tourism goes to places, creates a lot of waste and, and destroys uh, the environment to the people who have to live there. So, uh, it, you know, thinking about the kind of material impacts of uh, Buddhist practice, it comes down to it. And I think that idea of place-based ideas is also, those studies will inform environmental humanities in a way, um, because uh, there's a really interesting idea that I think Tom Van Doren has been talking about, who, he's a person who works on extinction studies and looks at, at specific instances of extinction. And his idea is he's saying that it's not as if all humans all the time are doing things that destroy environments everywhere. Yeah, it's specifically some places humans do bad things uh, or do destructive things. Uh, and if we can figure out the places where it's most destructive, uh, then we can we can moderate the way that we think about it. And, and I was, I've been thinking about it, that a lot when I'm thinking about the journey that, I, that I've like personally been on to try and understand this connection between environmentalism and, um, and Buddhism. And so the, one of the images I have on the screen there is me as an eight-year-old in the 80s <laughs> destroying the, the barrier reef because we were told at that point, just go for a walk on it and make sure you wear shoes. So I, I was personally involved in helping to destroy one of the world's great environmental wonders. Um, but then I was also thinking about the ways that um, it's going to on pilgrimage affects the places that uh, I have traveled to. Um, if there's ways to go to these places and have less of an effect, but then there's also a, 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 um, uh, another way to look at that as well, because in a lot of ways, pilgrimage has always played a role as being something that in, 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 uh, encourages empathy encourages solidarity with other peoples because you are traveling to other places understanding different ways of being uh, so i have an image of kailash which we went to on pilgrimage um it is a sacred mountain in western tibet and also the idea of offer making offerings to the monks in the bottom my bottom left hand corner um i remember after these monks went on procession at bulgaria and were given sweets in packages that there was just rubbish all over the area that had come from the, an act of, of, of Buddhist piety. Uh, and then also the thing, the idea of how we understand how to operate in different spaces and uh, try um, try not to be this poor lady in this photo, which I now feel bad for picking on, who, who was who's approaching a Buddhist emblem uh, as a, um, a selfie spot. So, you know, thinking about the way that we operate in these places. Um, and Okay, I've got <laughs> in my last minute, um, there's, I, I, while I've just spent a lot of time, as I spent heaps of time saying, you know, there's different systems, uh, ecology and Buddhism, they're both invented and then we're trying to figure out how uh, they work together and what parts of them work and, and I'm not sure that we can do it in a big systemic way. As I was doing all of these things, I, I started to think of like an example that maybe the, uh, the uh, may be the um, exception that proves the rule. And that came to me that the, the, uh, um, there is this idea of earth system. And in Tibetan, that when they translate the word uh, habit is hom. And when they talk about meditation, it's gom. And that gets lost in, that's one of the things I thought was the worst thing to get lost in translation between Tibetan and English, is that uh, actually doing meditation, what you're doing is changing it is effectively changing your habits so that you understand the world differently, you live in the world differently. Uh, so maybe if we can get back to this idea of changing human habits, um, then we can start thinking about it in terms of a, an earth systems way and start thinking about how we change um, international habits. I mean, there are parallels there. I don't know if that will help though. I really don't know. That gets back to the previous thing that I was saying at the beginning that um, I'm not sure how much thinking differently actually changes the environment that we live in. So maybe um, it, it, it's something to, to ponder on, uh, but I really think that we need to get 
back to looking at very specific, complicated instances of where Buddhism uh, on the ground, grounded specific, complicated instances of where Buddhism interacts with politics and society and ecologies and figure out what's happening in those spaces, enter into those spaces with solidarity and um, and, and altruism and uh, empathy. And maybe uh, that's a better way of going to it than coming up with another idea. So I'm saying there are other possibilities there, but I'm not sure whether we should engage with them. So um, thanks very much for listening. And I've got lists of references for uh, all, the all the articles that I talked about. If you want them, please let me know. Thanks. Thank you so much for that thought-provoking talk, Ruth. Um, so we've got one question coming through, I'm sure. Um, if there are others, please do post them in the Q&A. Um, so the first um, is from Rose, and it's a comment regarding swears distinctions. Um, and, and it reads, I guess it depends on how much Buddhism is understood to be combined by originary scriptural texts and how reinterpretable um, it might be. So thinking of Thich Nhat Hanh's more recent formulation of interbeing as an ethical basis for the interpersonal, as well as rethinking the relationship between self and nature, all based on previous ideas, it would seem to me that interbeing, um, as an example, is a development rather than a reiteration. Yeah, I would agree. It's a development rather than a reiteration. But I, I mean, I don't think that's a bad thing. That's what I was trying to say. Like you're going to have all of these different instances where Buddhism is reformulated. Everybody who comes to it comes with their own story. Everybody who uh, uh, inter interacts with it does it in a specific way in a specific circumstances. I mean, Buddha's teachings tell us that. <laughs> um, yes. So, so I think that this uh, idea that they can't develop, that there's something wrong with developing, there's something wrong with trying to engage with things that are happening at the moment is a bit weird and the only way I can think of to describe it is it's like very um almost protestant not, not even protestant because protestant, but, but it's kind of like this idea of it's very abstract so maybe very academic uh way of understanding buddhism um is to say it should be like this and I've decided what it should be like and therefore you can't change it it's always changing it's impermanent so yeah but, but, and then happens, I had it you think that that happens more among the converts Maybe, but then people are being converting to Buddhism for a very long time, um, you know, and it's and, it, and it's about how things change. Sometimes things change slowly, sometimes things change fast. Yeah, and it depends on the circumstances they're in. And my, my example that I can think of uh, to, to give you an example of this that's, um, that strikes me as you said it was, I remember uh, Thay Siddharam talking about the robes that Tibetans had being very different from the robes that monks had. They had to adapt them because otherwise, as he put it, you'd have a lot of frozen dead monks. Yeah, they had to be adapted because of the circumstances they were in. They had to be changed. They had to have different rules to, and, that, and that's within the kind of really strict um, uh, boundaries of uh, the, uh, the Sangha, like the people who take ordination and, uh, and commit to following vows, then you already had changes. Yeah, uh, it's just some things, some things take a long time, and that's another thing that you learn from um, uh, environmental humanities. Some things happen slowly, some things happen fast. Um, and so we can see things easier when they happen fast, but that doesn't mean it's not happening. So I'd say that there's no moment in Buddhist history where it, Buddhism stands good still. It's always changing. Yeah. Um, a, a question from Tim. Um, how can Buddhists go against the system if they're operating within a Western capitalist system? And he puts, yeah. for example, when going on pilgrimage or other ways, they may participate in the dominant system. So I guess the question sort of is, how does that work? You know, how do you? Operate yeah, I don't think we can. Well, I think that this is part of the. This is a excellent question, Tim. Super impressed um, <laughs> because this is the crux of the problem. I mean, our disturbing environmental systems are, are, are exactly that system. You know, even the way that we're talking at the moment, we are engaged in those systems. We're using uh, energy coming from, to, in order to run the computers um, that is using up more energy than some other people in the world use in a, in, in a month, right? Just to have this conversation. We live in a resource intensive environment. So I'm not sure we can operate outside those systems. To me that that would be, um, you know, uh, it, 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 
by achieving nirvana would maybe be it. But, uh, but the only other way that we can do it within a social thing is to change the system, right? You have to, you, you can't operate outside of with systems that you are encased within, that you are in, that you are embodied within. You have to work in order to change those systems. I mean, that's like the cliche in, in environmentalism, system change, not climate change, right? We need to change the system so we're doing less damage. And, and, and part of the reason we need to do that is to recognize um, the uh, systems that the, the, uh, the way that they're operating. Um, so we're aware of that. That's the first, it's like the, the um, four sites of the Buddha. That's the first thing that you recognize is what's going on here. How do we get here and how can we change it? Um, John, John has a comment about Richard Gombrich. He says that he dismisses the idea that dependent arising can or should be applied to the current ecological crisis because, quote, I can see no mention of this in the Pali Canon, but ideas are always being repurposed to meet new challenges. Originalism has a certain appeal, but the idea that we must always follow the original intent would make it impossible for any tradition to adapt. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think that's true. I, the other, the, the other, and, and it's also kind of a, a very abstract way of talking about it. I mean, but there's, I guess there's like a, there's an, there's an appeal to something else there as well, right? That there, there's things within the Pali Canon that are very much specifically focused on monks doing meditation. And maybe there's like a sense that if everyone's out there, you know, fighting for uh, climate justice, that they're not going to be doing the meditation. And I take that definitely as a point, you know, there's like things within the tradition. And that's why I was saying right at the beginning, like I, I, I'm, I'm a, still a Buddhist because I don't think that you can figure it all out yourself, right? Like that, that's a big part of being part of a Sangha, part of a community uh, as well, because you can, it's too easy to get trapped up in your own ego and not see beyond yourself. So having that continuity and lineage is, I'd still say, is being very important. And it's just figuring out the tensions between um, how you make a commitment to that spiritual path and how you live in a place uh, that are in, in a time uh, where there's these urgent issues uh, that, that come up in your face all the time. So I can see both. We need both. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's a, another question here from Colin, and Colin is sort of phrased, from your experience of Buddhism in the West and in the and in the Asian context, I guess to the contrast, do you yeah. think that exposure to Buddhist traditions has affected how the West thinks about the environment? So has there been kind of a, a crossover influence? Yeah, um, I, the environment, that's an interesting one, because um, I'm not sure how we think about the environment. Uh, and that was it. It's always S's. This is like the thing in my head. It's like, there's always S's. What is, it depends on which environment you're talking about, right? So um, it, I would say the place, and it's what you're all uh, are focused on as well, the place where I'd say Buddhism has had the most effort, effect, the most influence uh, in the like Western sphere, it, I would say is in kind of psychology and the way that we understand the mind. Um, and there are um, through that instances where I see people talking about the environment and care for the environment and so on that seem to me to have come through the wellness movement and the um, the kind of um, the the adaption of Buddhist ideas into psychology um, and I, I I think that idea of deep ecology appeals to a lot of people and although I think it's kind of a uh, an interesting development from Buddhism rather than an instance of Buddhism that the deep ecology movement has been informed by Buddhism by one particular form of Buddhism and that's had an effect uh, on some understandings of of the environment I mean you get even like full-on died in the wall wolf died in the wall died in the wall <laughs> um, uh, uh, earth system scientists that talk about Gaia Right, and I think that there are links between uh, earth systems and deep ecology and Gaia that um, uh, ha have like a trickle out effect as opposed to trickle down effect. Yeah. Um, so Gawain has uh, made the statement, he said, one of the contributions that Buddhism can make is helping activists deal with the many conflicts that arise from being contributors to environmental problems yeah. as well as activists. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what I was saying. I think the major effect that Buddhism has had on the way we think about things is um, through therapy um, and different and wellness. Um, I do think that it does, but I'm really worried about, well, am I worried about it? Worried's not the right word. Um, I see dangers along this road because I honestly think that in some ways there's an element of Buddhism where you kind of just need to... Um, 
there's an element of it's not about us, right? So it really, uh, the, the major thing I remember or the monks that I worked with saying is if you want to be happier, think about others. Yeah, and I think that there's a danger if we start thinking about cognitive therapy and how we can deal with the environments. Really, we've got stuff all to complain about, you know. I mean, even when we have floods and bushfires here, we had so many resources to draw on and everything. That the like the the idea of solidarity with people who are really being impacted um, by climate and are going to be more impacted is kind of more important. So maybe um, a focus on uh, kind of effective altruism, on uh, using cognitive therapy, kind of to think about others, I don't know. There is a danger, it seems to me, that we can try and solve our own environmental anxiety rather than thinking about what other, is happening to other people who are in much more dire straits. I'm not sure I've got the complete answer to that, but I do think it's like a, um, it, it's, a, it's, a it's a danger, yeah. Yeah, and well, that makes me wonder, I mean, there's been a lot of conversations around, you know, can, can, can you utilize practices like meditation or that, that yeah. may be inspired from Buddhism as a way of, um, taking a sense of sort of desperation or whatever, right. what, you know, I mean, it's sort of this yeah. sense that nothing's ever going to get better. And can you, can yeah. you then kind of track, you can sit with that in a way sort of Definitely. Like cultivate empathy and sort of direct that towards action, towards, re, you know, resolving the kinds of issues. Do you, do you see a absolutely. way forward for that? I absolutely think that all of that is um, good and possible. I'm just concerned that um, that becomes the main focus um because yeah. that's what like we like that's what we in the west seem to do a lot <laughs> is to make it about us again and that was like i was trying to say about the um yeah, yeah. the whole construction of the uh ecological buddhism buddhist academia and all that it's always about what we think and it's like wait a minute what we need to do is develop a sense of solidarity and start thinking about others more and that actually ends up being good therapy but it but if you can't get there because you're really struggling with stuff. And I know people really are struggling with things and that's a great idea. I just don't think it should be the end goal. Yeah, no, that's a great point. So it, it, may, be, it may be important for people to sit with things that are uncomfortable yes. because that may be the yes. thing that actually may drive them to do something other than just appease their own sense of discomfort. Getting used to being uncomfortable is really important. <laughs> and in so many different ways, right? It, it's gonna be important for us to be able to exist in the next 50 years or so as the um, the climate changes. Um, it's going to be important for us to transform our systems and it's important for us to be uncomfortable in order to be good allies, I'd say. In, in the West, arguably, maybe we could learn a bit more about the kinds of discomfort that others experience. Because yeah. as you pointed out, yeah. you know, we, we have every comfort available to us whenever things go wrong, we can turn up yeah. the AC, we've got resources to help us. And we're in the you know, God realm. Really helpful for us yeah. to understand. <laughs> yeah, the Buddh Buddh Buddhists have this idea, but then at the same time, we have to be kind of gentle with ourselves in some ways, I think it's like Buddhists have this idea that the greatest suffering that you can have in samsara is being a God and knowing you're going to die, right? So that idea that we are so, com so used to being comfortable that little things really disturb us. I think, you know, training to be, to have this comfort is really, Good practice. <laughs> well, thank you so much for this presentation, Ruth. That was really thought provoking, and it was just really great to hear on the topic. Um, I know from my own perspective, and I, and I hope for our audience. Um, thank you to the audience for joining us today. Uh, please subscribe to our newsletter to stay informed about this and other upcoming events um, in our series and others hosted by the Contemplative Study Center. Um, and we look forward to seeing you all and, and Ruth, hopefully, seeing you again um, in the not too distant future. Thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs>